first speaker is Britt Babcock. He's the president of Avanti. Um, civil engineering degree from Colorado State University. 25 years of experience in design and construction. Spent most of his those years in geotechnical engineering. But right now, he is a head dude at Avanti. <laughs> Please welcome Britt Babcock. All right, all right. Um, yeah, like Don said, uh, we've, we've, we're, we're starting to look at action steps now, and uh, Avanti's been a manufacturing supplier of chemical grouts and cementitious grouts to help control uh, infiltration into sanitary sewer systems, collection systems. So uh, the title says your first defense. It definitely could be a defense. Like Don said, there's multiple bullets and multiple tools in the toolbox that allow us to help uh, address infiltration and, and inflow. So um, we've already talked about this a little bit. We are going to see some redundancy, uh, like Jim said as well. Um, somebody talked about SSOs. We've heard a lot about those already this morning uh, or this afternoon. And uh, it definitely is a huge problem across the country. This is just another quote from the EPA. Uh, talks about all the, um, how it's, almost half of all flow into the water treatment plants uh, is contributed to I&I &I from a nationwide perspective. And it's definitely a huge problem, and it's only going to get worse with time if it's unaddressed. There are multiple points of infiltration and inflow. Jim had a great slide that itemized these out. There's just a graphical representation that shows all of those different points, um, everything from uh, the trench bed to the house connections to um, other pipe systems like storm pipes that may flow into the trench bed of the sanitary sewer lines, um, laterals, lateral connections, the taps, different locations definitely play a role in contributing to infiltration and inflow. Uh, closer snapshot of what that sanitary sewer pipe will look like is we're going to focus mostly, our technique applies specifically to infiltration. So sanitary sewer pipes and taps for laterals and the laterals themselves just a snapshot or a cross section of what that might look like um, where water can come in. Groundwater can flow in through cracks in the pipes. It can throw in, flow in through joints um, at the taps for the uh, laterals as well. Um, and what does that do long term to that infrastructure, right? Whether it's surficial pavements, whether it's uh, the pipe itself, long term it's going to degrade that. There's going to be um, siphoning of fines that come in and create voids around those pipes. It's going to create um, dest uh, destructive effect. <clears throat> what does it look like at the treatment plant? Well, when we're at the treatment plant, we've, we've already, Jim had some great graphical representations of what those loads look like. Um, this shows a storm event comes in at peaks. It has average load on the base, but it's the rainfall derived infiltration, I and I. We've seen that RD acronym already, but rainfall derived infiltration inflow will have a dramatic impact on water treatment plants. This is what Tony's stopping, right, in Naperville. I think we can take that pink completely out, right, on most of Tony's, where they're complaining about not having enough water, right? Um, so really, what's the reality of our systems? They're old and decrepit. They're decayed. Um, systems have been put in decades and decades ago, and uh, those joints are starting to fail. In a lot of cases, some of the pipes are still in great shape, but the joints are failing. And so um, once we lose those joints, soils start to decay, start to siphon in, and we start to see stages of uh, structural decay of the pipe. Pipes will move. They'll siphon in there. Um, in the top ring, you'll see that as water comes into that joint, it's bringing soils with it, whether it's sands, fines for clays, and that then weakens that pipe joint, and you'll see movement as you step down that. Um, and there becomes a point in time where grouting, which is what we're going to talk about predominantly within my presentation, um, there comes a point in time where grouting is no longer an effective solution. That's where you have to step into your other toolboxes. Grout's a great solution for a structurally sufficient and a structurally sound pipe system. Um, what infiltration is still a major combatant for that situation. So, great segue for my own comment. Uh, structural versus non-structural. What are the 
when you do a condition assessment, what is, what percentage of your pipe is structurally sound? Does it really need to be relined? Does it need to be um, uh, burst and uh, replaced, right? How much of it is structural? How much of it is non-structural? So if it's a sound pipe and it's just infiltration that we're tackling, grout can be a great solution. That could be a, the tool that you can reach out to to stop that infiltration. So uh, when you're doing your condition assessment, that's obviously a key parameter, key parameters that are measured. So grout, uh, you know, it's designed to stop infiltration. Um, it is complementary to other techn trenchless technologies. It's not meant to compete. Uh, we work side by side, uh, hand in glove with CIPP. We're often grouting's done ahead of time to stop the infiltration to allow CIPP to be installed. Um, it's generally used where non-structural repairs are needed. It can be a great long-term solution and uh, faulty joints, holes in liners, detect defects in pipe. So um, think of grout. <clears throat> What is grout? What are the grout characteristics? It's a two component system mixed in separate tanks. You have tank A, you have tank B. Gel times can be anywhere from 30 seconds upwards to a minute, typically for sanitary sewer lines. Um, even though it can be controlled up to 10 hours, that's not something we probably see in the situations ever. Um, but uh, we have that capability. So uh, it was developed in the 1950s for soil stabilization. Um, and then first used in 1962 by National Power Rod to actually grout a sanitary sewer line. That's a, it's a funny story. I don't want to steal John's story, but um, I'll, I'll hold that back. I don't know if you're going to tell that story or not. But, um, and if I hope I get this right, I think I, do, I will, but they grouted the line and they didn't think anything was happening. So they stopped, went to lunch, came back, and all the water had stopped because the grout had taken hold and sealed off the water. And so um, at that point in time, the grouting, the use of grout to stop infiltration was born at that moment. So uh, there's over 40 years of successful documented use uh, for grouting. I think we're pushing that number to 50 now since we're in 2021. Um, and so uh, we believe it's got a long service life, upwards of 50 years. Um, there's a lot of people, a part of our panel that are working with NASCO um, to uh, develop new specifications. We're focusing on a 25-year service life because we've seen that physically in the field. Tony's personally seen that within his collection system, a 25-year success life of grout. So um, what does the grouting process look like? Here's a quick animation. Um, what they'll use is they'll have a um, push-pull packer. It's a dual inflated packer with a camera. And they'll take that packer and straddle the joint, that packer will inflate and there's hoses that are then connected to the truck that has the tanks mixed and those hoses then push both the components in together and once the components touch each other, then the A and B components then create that gel. And <clears throat> what's to note here is we get the question a lot of, well, you're just grouting the joint. No, we're grouting and creating a soil gel matrix outside of the joint, if you will. I guess I'm doing it this way, really this way outside of the joint, um, depending on the soil type you're in. Now, if it's a clay, it's a little different. I've got a slide to show how that'll look a little later on. But when you think of grouting a joint, you're thinking of lateral tap or the lateral joints and cracks and fissures that may be accepting joint. It's not grouting the joint itself, but we're creating that soil grout matrix on the outside. That's what gives grouting longevity. So, um, Here's a snapshot of a lateral grouting packer, similar to the mainline packer we just saw, but there's an extra component. There's gonna be a, um, an extra sock that then gets pressurized up into the lateral. Camera's still there as well. And you see the infiltration coming into the animation. They'll turn the packer to align with the lateral, inflate the main, then they'll inflate the sock which will isolate the grout to the locations it needs to be, push that grout in, pump it in, again, creating that soil matrix, filling up whatever void might be there, and creating that soil grout matrix. They'll retract the sock, and voila, you can have a sealed joint within seconds. Oftentimes we get asked, like I said before, we don't compete with CIPP, but we complement it. 
Um, we've already talked about and we've heard about where CIP people will done. The water will then relocate to the laterals. The lateral grouting is, a, is really important or controlling infiltration at the laterals is very important. Um, because that annulus is between the CIPP and the host pipe, uh, water will find that path. So similar situation here, same sock gets pushed back up into the lateral, but now the grout finds its way into that annulus as well to help create that seal. Retract the sock and a sealed lateral. All right, manholes, we have a lot of animations. Manholes are definitely a key asset to controlling infiltration. Uh, oftentimes what we can do is curtain grout a manhole with grout, or you can target the joints with the manhole. Um, this is a pretty simplistic perspective of grouting of a manhole. They are a key part of an asset collection system. Uh, we'll get, grout will be pumped in behind the manhole wall, creating a curtain. And, uh, Great way to think about it is maybe a, a koozie around a soda pop is basically what you're creating around a manhole. If you think of a manhole like a, a Pepsi can or a Coke can, and you're creating that koozie around the outside, grout can be pumped in to the back side of that. And that can be an acrylic gel or that could be a urethane grout, depending on uh, what either the contractor may like to use, has the equipment to use, or that municipality's, municipality's preference. So one of the things that comes up quite a bit is uh, when we think about the acrylic gels that are used for grouting is do they shrink? And a white paper was done three or four years ago now, um, independent study to measure uh, what we'd already known. We hadn't scientifically shown it. And there were some great people that got behind this paper and took a lot of time, effort, and energy to make it happen. And um, what they did was took that paper, or drilled a hole into the ground and measured relative humidity in the soil. And when I first heard about it, I thought, well, what are you talking about? It's got to be changed, change in water moisture content. And I'd measured enough soil contents and moisture contents to think that, well, that's going to vary throughout the, the depth of profile of the hole. They measured the hole down 15 feet, drilled it down 15 feet, dropped in uh, humidity sensors and measured that over a four month period in Riverside, California. Believe it or not, Riverside, California is one of the driest places in the country. Um, I didn't think it until I researched it, actually called Phoenix and said, you guys got to be drier than them. And they actually said, no, we're not. Um, and so what they found was that the relative humidity in the soil was basically essentially 100% from the surface down. And it wasn't until I was standing in that field and it was a plowed field. And I took a clod and if you, any of us, I can't step too far from the mic. Sorry. Any of us have ever been in a field, and you knock over a, cl a clot of dirt, what does the bottom of the clot of dirt look like? It's moist. Even though the top of it can be dry and desiccated from the sun, having been be beat on for days and weeks and months. But if you flip that over, at the very bottom of it, it's gonna be moist. So because of that relative humidity and those acrylic gels being a hydrophilic type material, meaning it likes to have water, <clears throat> um, we scientifically showed that the, gel, the acrylic gels will maintain their shape. A lot of belief was that they dried out because if we were to mix a cup of it, put A and B together in front and let it sit here on this um, desk, it would dry out over time because it would evaporate moisture out of the component. But in the soils, there's enough moisture in the soil to maintain its consistency. Um, Another exhaustive study was done on acrylamide grouts or acrylic gels uh, that started in 1988. It was about a 25 year study, sorry, a 20 year study that measured multiple different grouts. Um, uh, and what they found was uh, they measured longevity and an expected li service life of a grout, I'm sorry, expected half life um, on decay. And at a 20 percent, there's different grout concentrations, and, and um, I could go into it probably take up my entire time talking about the calculations and stuff, but uh, that study initially was based on a 20% grout concentration. Historically, to put that in perspective, our industry, the grout industry for sanitary sewer collection systems has used a 10% grout concentration. Um, that's important because we're pushing towards a 12% now for a myriad of different purposes. Um, 
one, to help avoid washout during uh, installation, and two, more importantly for longevity, is when we back calculate 12% off of what was calculated during this um, U.S. Department of Energy study, uh, it, based on some fairly conservative assumptions, um, we come up with 50-year design life. So um, I'm excited that we, within the NASCO organization, are shooting for a 25-year out the gate, but we, I do believe that we'll stretch to 25 and, and through the next iteration, or I'm sorry, we'll stretch to 50 in the next iteration, or at least I hope we do anyway. Um, but the grout, regardless of what moisture content it's at or regardless of what grout concentration it's at, the biggest impact is how it's installed. So um, really it comes down to the how, not the what or the why, and um, that's also one of the many things we're working on to try to improve in our industry. And there's great strides being made in that, and there's some great contractors out there doing fantastic work. Uh, how are the grouts joined, how are the grouts behave in different soil types? I mentioned this early on. Um, grout is a water-based type material, an acrylamide grout or an acrylic gel. So it's gonna follow the path of least resistance, just like any water-based type component, right? So as you can imagine, if you know what a 57 stone looks like, it's like a gravel road, right? Um, it's gonna be gapped with big voids, big porosity, and then a sand's gonna be a little bit tighter, and then a clay is gonna be extremely tight, right? A clay may only have fissures or, or cracks or um, small areas that it can travel in. These are three photographs. Um, on your far right is a 57 stone. As you can imagine, the grout traveled everywhere within that. This is a test cell that uh, was performed by a consortium of peers in our industry uh, over years' time, and they ran multiple to, a multitude of different tests on it and uh, exhumed it very meticulously, and it was a fantastic work that was done. Um, you, if you can look in the bottom of the 57 stone picture, you'll see that it was all bedded in 57 stone, and everywhere that bedding was at, the grout traveled there, traveled the path of least resistance. In the sand, it didn't travel quite as far, but still created a nice base. And you can see that it created, within that uh, defect, a nice soil gel matrix uh, in the middle picture. To your far left is the clay where it created fissures. It traveled within the fissures of the clay, traveled within the, uh, the contacts between the clay and the pipe itself. So the higher the fines content of a material, the difference in the material will travel throughout the, throughout the soils. Um, stabilizing the pipe is a question that's always been in, uh, in play within the industry. We, we have always believed that it happened, um, but that study, along with just field demos like this, shows that we do and we can accomplish uh, pipe bedding support when it's, um, the soils are amenable, meaning what kind of grout they'll take is amenable to it. So, quick <laughs> quote by Dr. Vipu. Um, I think a lot of us in here may know who Dr. Vipu is. Uh, he's a chairman and professor of uh, civil and environmental engineering at the University of Houston and uh, heads up SIGMAT, which is also another organization within the grouting industry, which is doing great work. But uh, he definitely is a strong believer in the use of grouts for um, controlling groundwater uh, and infiltration to, to be a very cost-effective and durable solution. So I won't read that verbatim, but I'll let you guys read that when you, when you get your copies. So... Um, with that, we'll take any questions. You illustrated there earlier uh, a means of uh, sealing a line after uh, uh, lining and uh, where you had water coming in near a, uh, a service lateral. And then uh, also there was a reference made by somebody earlier about even doing uh, grouting prior to do it do a straight lining uh, yeah. a cure in place or something like that. So wh what I was curious about is, is do you have any background or experience uh, that you could, you could give as guidance on what seems to generally be the most economic strategy to uh, do grouting before or do like what you illustrated here of line and then grout the kind of the last pieces or, or are there consider, 
if that's an impossible question to answer, could you give us some idea of what, uh, which way you might go, of uh, what factors would govern the most? Yeah, that's a great question, George. The the question is is um, is lining is grouting prior to lining a commonly accepted practice, and is it more economical than grouting post lining? Um, uh, from what I understand in the industry and what we experience is that grouting pre lining typically happens almost always. Um, just because infiltration has such a negative impact on the, the liner curing process. So um, what we do see is they'll change the grout concentration pre or lining because it's a temporary solution. Because um, once you stop that water in the main line, um, let's say at a joint away from a tap, uh, that grout help stops that. And then once they grout that tap, that grout at the joint down the ray between taps is no longer necessary because the CAPP is creating that seal, if that makes sense. And the water, if that, let's say that that water was dry during the low groundwater season and the, uh, there was no infiltration at the time of CIPP installation. And let's say they didn't grout the taps. Well, the groundwater came up then the water is going to follow that annulus to the tap and create that infiltration. So they could grout it um, at those taps to stop the infiltration after the fact. I don't know if I'm just making sense, but usually it generally happens prior to the installation of CIPP is our understanding. Good question. 